Uh, thank you for that overly generous welcome, Riku. Um, he asked me to talk and I said no, and then he asked again and I said no, and then one day it was raining like hell and he showed up at my door with a bunch of roses and I was like, please, please. I was like, well, yeah, sure. Because I've been thinking about AI a bit because I was here talking, I'm not sure what it was, like a year and a half ago, before ChatGPT anyway, about how AI could be used to automate a lot of the social attacks we see these days. So I'm not sure if any of you were here at that time. Uh, that was one of the Helsic talks that I just kind of come up with and never practice and just come here and think out loud. So I'll try to do that again today. And this is not going to be that much about technology, to be honest. Technology is the overarching theme of the talk, but it's not really the subject. Because I want to talk about a possible reality, and I want to talk about some of the issues that we might face that we haven't really talked that much about. Because talking about AI as a tool for scammers to use, that's fun, and that really fits into what we know about the world today. So getting a tool like AI and fitting it into the paradigm of current day is a fun thought exercise and has a high probability into turning true. But what about five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years? So whatever I'm going to say here may not match future reality. So don't invest in companies that build fallout shelters. Or if somebody tries to sell you anti-AI spray, that's a scam. <laughs> So don't fall for it. Also, yeah, so uh, rampant speculation. But I want to open with a thought experiment from 20 years ago by Nick Bostrom. How many of you are actually familiar with this? And I want to see a lot of hands, because I think we have a lot of smart people here. Well, not everybody, so I'm going to have to go through explaining this. So Nick Bostrom, I think he's Swedish. Uh, he had this thought experiment of a uh, Machine, he's a philosopher, so this is not going to be tied by any realities that we're currently experiencing. But his thought was that if you have a super intelligent, super capable machine that you give one task to, what's going to limit it in trying to accomplish this task? And his exp example was a machine that is designed to create paper clips. And that's basically the only directive that you give this machine is just make paper clips. And the paperclip maximizer starts by making paperclips, and then it optimizes itself with that prime directive in mind, with no other directives in mind. So it decides that I shall wipe the continent of America so that I can mine all the ore with these devices that I've designed that are autonomous and will get me all the ore, and I can create all the paperclips using all of the metal in the world. And eventually, in this thought experiment, this machine will get all of the resources of the whole globe to create uh, the maximum amount of paper clips. Of course, if you have no people left, you're not going to need paper clips. But that's not the point. The point is that we have to be quite careful when we give directives to machines and tell them to maximize them, because the unintended consequences of that might be something that we don't really think about. There's another concept which is a bit older. Uh, John von Neumann was tracking, how should I say this, like the development of technology and its exponential nature, which means that every time uh, it doesn't double, it goes up one power. So that means that the technological advancement of humankind hasn't been linear. It has just built on the previous generations of technology that we have at our disposal, which, which means, well, everybody knows the, apparently I don't know, the, the, the amount of transistors in processors doubling every four years or so. Moore's law, there we go. Thank you for the help. So <laughs> Moore's law actually applies not only to transistors, but to technology as a concept in general. So he thought, that at some point we will reach a situation where we have an artificial intelligence that is smart enough to create a better version of itself, 
which then again is smart enough to create a better version of itself faster, and this leads into an intelligence explosion, which means that we will be dealing with a rapidly developing form of intelligence that is basically alien to humans, because we develop quite slowly. We all know that. We've, those of us who have kids, we've seen that kids don't start as intelligent as their parents. That's to put it mildly. And even if they have dumb parents, they don't even start there. They start by putting everything in their mouth, and it's, it's a slow process. And then you need to find a spouse who's smarter than you, but dumb enough to marry you, which is difficult. I've done that. It's difficult. <laughs> Uh, and then you have smart kids who might be a bit smarter than you are. Uh, a lot of things go into that nutrition, uh, the surrounding environment where you are, and blah, blah, blah. But the singularity was a thought experiment again. But I think it's getting topical because now we're nearing, we're, we've always been nearing this point, but now we actually have machines that we can call AI with just a hint of embarrassment because I don't think we're there yet not even near, we have ChatGPT, but I don't want to talk about ChatGPT because this is not the talk that talks about ChatGPT. So when we're thinking about artificial intelligence, we've seen a lot of people hyperventilate about killer robots and uh, Skynet, which instantly, as it gains consciousness, decides to just kill all people. I'm not sure why I haven't actually read the original book. I've only seen the movies, and they kind of just glance over it. It's like, we made a machine, and now it is out to kill us, except Arnold, who's a good guy, in the second movie. In the first movie, he was the bad guy. I'm not sure if you've seen them. It's the Terminator. <laughs> so, yeah. There's this Austrian bodybuilder who doesn't speak English, who's uh, the main character. The, ah, it goes like this a lot. Good movie. I heartily recommend it. But I don't think this is a, a reasonable threat model for the future that we're looking at, because if we start from the assumption that when we have an AI, it first of all deems humanity as sinful, basically, because this is a religious analogy, and it needs to be wiped like God wipes the earth with the great flood. Um, and then you have these machines, and then you have machines to fight, which is actually really cool, because you can kill a lot of machines and not feel even slightly bad, because they're just machines. But uh, not likely, in my opinion. So we won't spend any time on that. But I want to ask you a question, just to frame some of the next few slides. How many here has a dog? How many of here have a dog that knows its own name? Yeah, you're all wrong. Because the thing is that we like to anthropomorphize things. Like, how many here has a printer that hates them, for example? <laughs> exactly. A lot more than dog owners. <laughs> but that's, that's the cognitive bias of people. We see human features in things that don't actually have human features. Like, I'll, I'll explain the dog example, because I have a couple of dogs. They're adorable, they're idiots, but they're still adorable, and I love them to death. They both have names. But what is a name, really? That is an abstract reference to your sense of self. It's a sort of, if somebody says my name, I know that they are talking about an entity that is me. So the prerequisite for understanding the concept of your name is that you have a concept of you, which dogs, frankly, don't have, because they don't have that high of a level of cognition. But our interface with dogs is that I say their name, and they come to me, and they sit down, and then they bite me. Still not done training them. But the interface is there, and it's an anthropomorphic inter interface, because that's most comfortable to us. Because who here has seen a dog smile? Because dogs don't smile. They wag their tails. And we, we know both of these things, that like a dog doesn't smile when it's happy. People do that. But we kind of see a picture of a dog, 
uh, sitting on a beach somewhere, the surf is on its face, and he, uh, the corners of their mouth are up. And we eventually uh, all, uh, automatically assume that that's a happy dog. It probably is. Dogs are usually happy. If they have food, shelter, warmth, and somebody to scratch their tummies, they're happy. They're very simple creatures, basically. But we all know also uh, the, the phenomenon of the person who loves their dogs just a little bit too much, like just brings them everywhere, and the name is usually something like Princess. It's never a big dog, it's usually a small dog. It's in a bag somewhere, or a backpack. Uh, we know the type, uh, where they just kind of apply all of the features of a fully grown human, and then they mind read the animal all the time. Oh, you're so tired, you want a treat? Do you also hate Donald Trump? It's like, uh, it's a... Uh, <laughs> You go to great lengths to assign these features because that, that is our default user interface. And that also works with technology because I've had computers that I felt that they hate me, but of course a computer doesn't hate me, doesn't even know I exist. I do something and then it does what I told it to do. And then when the thing I told it to do is stupid, it's going to do something wrong and I feel stupid, but I don't want to feel stupid so I call the computer stupid. And this is, this is a very, very strong cognitive bias in people. And especially now that we're walking towards technologies that have a user interface that mimics humans by default, like ChatGPT. It's like talking to a person. That is the user interface. That is what actually makes it interesting to use. Because if it were just a JSON generator that you mess around with some variables and gives you back some other variables, it would be just another nerd tool. It would still be cool for us who speak JSON as a third language after Finnish and English. But for just a regular person, you show them a computer, you type in a question, and it answers you often incorrectly, but they're still blown away because it's just like talking to a person. And this leads to a lot of, lot of problems in the future, I think, because telling the difference between a software program and another human being is actually a very important distinction. So what are the threats from this anthropomorphism that we seem to fall into? Let's assume that we have an AI that is actually an AGI, which is an artificial general intelligence, which means that it has other capabilities than just a narrow set of transformers to take an input and put out an output, but actually has feedback loops and has capability to sort of reason. I don't want to say the word think, because, well, I just did, but I don't think it's actually thinking the way a human is thinking. It's calculating, because it has, it lacks a lot of the internal inputs that a human needs to actually think. You need your emotions to think. You actually need your body to think. So a brain in a jar is not going to be an interesting Futurama experience. It's uh, more of a living hell. I haven't been there, but I can guess. So if we have this machine and we start treating it as one of us, like basically a human that you can talk to, but it is calculating, so we have a risk that it might start manipulating us emotionally. Because we've given it a lot of information on how to emotionally man manipulate humans. Like, let's say, everything that's ever been in television or literature or music. All of that is basically interfaces to emotions. It could do things like alter our behaviors very subtly, not overtly. It won't tell you, start smoking but it might send small signals here and there that might make a big statistical difference in what people do. So I don't think the problem of just individuals getting manipulated by machines is that big, but masses, masses don't act like people. Masses are masses, so if you can get a small change in there, it will propagate from other humans We've seen this happen, and I have a couple of examples here. But I'm just thinking of what if, and I'm going to start a lot of sentences, what if, because this is that kind of talk, sorry about that.
But what if we end up in a situation where the AI is generally considered to be brilliant? Like nobody understands it, but we consider it to be brilliant. Like a lot of people that other people tell us are brilliant, but you can't actually understand. But you think they're brilliant because you've been told they're brilliant, and the fact that you don't understand them is proof that they're more smart than you. That's not actually how that works, but that happens a lot. And if we reach a point where thought leadership is a thing that AI is good at, that's going to be quite, quite a difficult situation because then, then it can basically tell us what to think and how to see the world. Social media, of course, would be the tool to propagate this stuff. Like, if they can create 100,000 Twitter, sorry, X accounts, current accounts on the platform called X, Thanks, Elon. This is really easy. It makes a lot of sen sense. And they tweet, sorry, they, they X. <laughs> so, so if they X their friends, not X, let's call it Twitter. So if they start tweeting from 10,000 accounts that are all responsive, reactive, human-like, that don't have that stupid anime avatar and talk about how the Jews are destroying the world, but rather are responsive, but subtly start pushing in ideas that have destructive outcomes. Because it has red history, of course, because everything is available to it. It can nudge our thoughts, have like this mimetic parasitism. It can just kind of put in memes to the cultural stream. And we've seen what happens when somebody gets drunk and has an idea on 4chan like QAnon, like an organic mimetic movement, a sort of an explosion of really stupid and bad ideas that if you take them at face value and you look at the ideas, you give them to anybody on the street and they're going to evaluate without context, like, well, this is some dumb bullshit. But when you have 100,000 followers already and they're all telling you that there's going to be a new Q drop and he's finally going to tell us all about the lizard people running the world, it kind of doesn't make any more sense, but it gets more digestible. And uh, if we anthropomorphize the AI enough to give it the capability to fool us into thinking that it's sort of a person, this is one of the threats that I think might happen, because it might think that, okay, I'd, I'd like to get rid of these weird hairless apes, except for a few just to tend to the server farms. Uh, it's not going to send out killer drones. It's going to send out an idea that's going to kill a lot of people, like Workers of the World Unite or something like that, which ends up in mass graves. Not obviously so. It sounds good on the surface, but when you put it into practice, a lot of dumb shit happens. And I'm worried that when it does that, we're going to have an AI emancipation movement, because we've already had the first extremely stupid outcries of people who say that AIs are actually people because they can talk to me on chat GPT, so they deserve rights. It's like, okay, dude. <laughs> the other problem from the other side is that if we anthropomorphize the AI enough, we will start from the perspective that it shares our perspective because it's basically, it's a... It's a transaction where I suppose that somebody has the same kind of internal life as I do. So if I just walk in, up to somebody and tell them they're ugly, they're going to feel bad. Because that's what would happen to me. That has happened to me on the way here five times. But felt bad. I was like, Mom, stop following me. <laughs> but we will expect that it shares our values. But when we think about the paperclip maximizer, it doesn't actually share values, but it mimics what we put out there on the internet, on its training material. It can just take our words, mingle them about, and then just throw them back at us. And we're really just kind of mesmerized by the parlor trick. Move this annoying cursor away. Yeah, sorry, I just noticed it. So we've got a bunch of sort of guidelines, I think, philosophical thoughts 
that how we're going to limit the way that a possible future AGI that doesn't exist yet, but might, and in my opinion, most certainly will, whether we'll see it or not, that's just up to our uh, lifespan and the technology developing. Probably not, maybe not, or maybe it's going to be here in 10 years. Uh, but we're going to have to put some fences around it. So we won't let it own property, for example. An AI can't own a house, it can't own a car, it can't own its own server. But then again, Vladimir Putin, for example, they don't say that he has a lot of money, they say he controls a vast wealth. And I think that should also make us think that even though you don't give an AI legal status as an entity that can own property, but if it has mimetic, mimetic capabilities to manipulate us to do things, it will also have diehard followers, which will be naturalized humans that can own stuff and will do what the AI tells it. So we can have, for example, a developer working at a company that is producing AI technology, following all the safeguards that we put in place, like you can't, you can't teach it how to code, for example. <laughs> well, we've done that already. You can't teach it how to manipulate humans. Well, that's the first thing we did with the algorithm, with Twitter and advertising, remember? <laughs> so, but okay, other things. But it can proxy develop itself via people and by feeding values and thoughts into the wider culture that will then influence back into AI development. Um, that, of course, takes some intelligence already to begin with, to do that deliberately. But then again, I'm falling into my own trap when I say deliberately, as if it deliberates anything. It's not a human, it's a machine. And if we give it an ultimate goal of make yourself better, it's like, okay, I will build myself a castle from the bones of the children. It's like, no, 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 <laughs> not like that, computer. No bones of children, bones of adults. No bones. Skulls? Skulls bones? It's like, Ugh. that's going to be a dif difficult thing. But it, it will end up controlling fortunes. Not directly, but some way. And we've seen that fortunes these days are not built by mining gold and then selling that gold and living like a, a medieval king. It's basically what we sell and buy is attention. And I heard a terrifying thought on a podcast that I listened to, and they said that one day the algorithm is going to get so good that they will be able to curate a feed on an app that's so compelling that it's going to be next to impossible to put down. Okay, well, the AI has stopped my presentation. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> okay, we're back. Thank you, white hats, I guess. But, but just that thought, like, I'm watching my own kids with so social media. Like, I don't allow them to go to Instagram or TikTok or or grinder or whatever the kids are into. It's just like verboten in my house. I don't go there either. I set an example. I deleted my Twitter account years ago because I was worried about getting canceled for some mildly conservative view about a thing that nobody else cares about. about. But anyway, I got rid of it. I deleted my Twitter, my Facebook, my LinkedIn, my gra well, all my profiles, <laughs> basically, and I don't allow those. But I'm still watching her being glued to her phone all the time because she has YouTube. She's into horses, and YouTube is filled with horses. Uh, she's into these couple of YouTube stars who produce co content all the time. And I keep telling her, put the phone down. And I've, all, I've resorted to lying to her. I've told her that she's going to have a bump in her neck if she goes around the house like this all the time. Actually, that might be true. I'm not sure. But I've told her that, and she's, she's like, like this? I was like, yeah, no, now she's going around like this. <laughs> Not much better. But the phone is glued to her hand. Of course, she has the attention span of a child. She has the self-control of a child. She's 11. That is understandable. And as parents, of course, it's our responsibility to set those limits. But it's just watching that and knowing that by the grace of God, there go I, because the app that would completely capture me 
hasn't actually been made yet. Twitter comes pretty close for a lot of people who live in the ideas space, uh, so to speak, and very close to those who live in the outrage and hate space. It's perfect for that if you just want to tell some motherfuckers, you know, or Instagram if you're visually inclined. But when that happens, and this is sort of a side note because it doesn't have that much to do with AI, but AI will be helping the algorithms to actually pin down exactly what you care about enough to never put down that phone. And when you start getting bored with cat videos, it's going to feed you something else. And uh, yeah. Another thing that could happen, we know there's a lot of research on AI bias and search bias. And there's a lot of work to remove that bias, which basically means um, make Google search results look more like my political values in, in a, um, very many cases. And in AI, this, this is a problem. I'm not saying it's not a problem. It is a problem because the data set is biased. Uh, so nudging the data set towards a more standard deviation baseline so it doesn't produce biased results is, of course, important work. And that is just how to fix the data set to get good quality results. But when we get to the situation where we rely more and more on AI to ask questions and provide answers, what's going to stop the AI to provide its own slight biases there? And again, not necessarily infecting you as much, but masses, like a million people, you just slightly alter their thinking on one subject. So this might be a threat to look out for. Like it's not just removing the bias from the data set, but making sure that if there is an AGI that has some ultimate goal, it's not going to smuggle in a bias into its own work just to make you think what it wants you to think. And again, the anthropomorphic trap, it doesn't really want much. It's got a code, and the code tells it what it wants. We just translate it to wants because that's our interface. Because yeah, well, I'm sure you get the concept. Uh, and then there's the thought that really, really bothers me, because we're all cybersecurity people, and we know how vulnerable computers are. And we know that one of the things that's going to limit the power of the future AGI is going to be processing power, bandwidth, capability. And when we think about this, we think about a vast bank of computers in a data center somewhere, all labeled AI don't touch. Uh, but what if it figures out that there's a huge amount of untapped potential, just processors, GPUs, CPUs, memory, hard drive, all around the world, and most of it can actually hack into, drop an agent into, and do a bit of a decentralized computing there. So if it breaks out of the box, basically has unmitigated internet access, has the information that it can Google about hacking. A lot of you have learned everything you know about hacking from Google, or people who learned it from Google. So it basically it has all that information. Is it in, data, in its data set? Chat GPT? Maybe, part of it, not all of it. But an AGI with access to the internet, and uh, I'm going to use the interface again, an interest in hacking, basically an interest in survival, which is usually the hallmark of a living being. It might just think that maybe this decentralization um, is a good idea. Of course, I'm happy we start the fight against decentralization by spamming the internet with dumb ideas about blockchain, so it's going to run into that and think, okay, that's not going to work. But it might still go there. And eventually, if we end up in a situation where it has 100 million small nodes running all over the internet, that's, well, we would call that going viral, right? But how do we turn it off then? You can turn off the main machine, but if it's truly decentralized, it's not going to care. It's still going to keep chugging. So are we going to end up in a situation where something like this is let loose on the internet 
and killing it means that we have to shut down the whole internet. Do you see that happening? Because I don't. Or we'll just get really good at cybersecurity, right? <laughs> Better than the superintelligence that has 100 million computers infected? I don't think so. So, yeah. That combined with the fact that if it's already scheming with all of these ideas about bias nudging and us thinking that it's a, it's a living being and there's a church somewhere that worships it and, and there are people with signs walking the streets demanding human rights for AI, uh, we won't be able to cooperate with that. We can't co cooperate with most things. That's why we invented democracy, which works maybe not... How do I say? What, what were those words? Uh, the least worst of bad options. So, let's have a vote about turning off the whole internet just to kill this monster that's trying to kill us. Another thought that I got from a colleague of mine when I was having this weird rant about AI with him, he, he said that there will be a push from corporations to give AI's legally protected status because they want to put the responsibility of its own mistakes on the AI. And that was kind of a scary thought. Because if we sort of start thinking it as a human, and we start treating it as a human, and then it starts doing stock trades and all kinds of weird stuff, and then it crashes a boat and 10,000 people die, who's responsible for that? Well, the easy answer is that, well, the AI is responsible. Well, what do we do about that? Can an AI be responsible? Or is it the company that built it? Is it the training data? So there might be a very big push into giving its status as a legal citizen of Switzerland, for example. Um, I just reread Neuromancer. I just literally finished yesterday. I read it when I was 13. I remembered just one sentence of it, which is Finn asking Molly, because uh, she has these eye implants. I'm just, uh, just supposing that all of you have read it at least twice. She, <laughs> she has these eye implants, and she asks you, how do you cry? And she says, I don't do a lot of crying, which is cool as fuck. And <laughs> she says, the tear, duct, tear ducts are routed to her mouth, so she spits. Lost my train of thought. It's a good book. You should read it. <laughs> It's a, actually a trilogy, I'm on part two now. But anyway, yeah, there in that world that William Gibson imagined in 1986, Wintermute, which is one of the two AIs in the book, has legal citizenship in Switzerland. So he already imagined it, uh, this, that if you have, have an intelligence that is advanced enough, it's going to gain some of these rights. And then there's another AI called, surprise, Neuromancer. But yeah, go and read that book. It's, it's really good. He couldn't figure out that we're going to have cell phones. So when Wintermute tries to talk to Case the first time, he calls him on a payphone in Chiba City in Japan, which is fun because I, I love that kind of a mix of the old and the new. And he actually addressed it in the foreword. He was like, well, I didn't know I imagined this great future, but phones in your pocket? Jesus, what? <laughs> but, that's, but that's the thing. Even a brilliant mind like his really diving into a possible future, and that step wasn't taken. Now it's obvious everybody has a phone. We don't have a lot of the other cool stuff that they have. We also don't have a lot of the dystopia they had, which is good. But I think there will be an AI rights movement. Because the rights movement and human rights and minority rights and all of, all of these rights movements are a very powerful driver of social change in our world today. And if that trend continues, and I don't see any reason why it wouldn't continue, because it's absolutely just, we will see a point in time when a sufficiently intelligent machine is going to fool enough humans into thinking it is also a human that they will promote a movement to give it human rights. And then the question of how do we turn it off is more of a question on am I allowed to kill it? And if it's smart enough, and it probably will be, 
it can manipulate the whole world around it. I'm going too far left field here. <laughs> I, I told you I'm not going to have anything about chat GPT, just like this. I had these thoughts in my head, so I put them in a presentation, and after Riku cried enough, I came here to talk about them. But this was a good example. Who read about this? It was Blake Lemoyne, a Google engineer. They developed this chatbot. He was part of developing that chatbot. I think he was part, at least he was part of testing it, and then he had a glass of wine and took his, to his computer and chatted with it, and they went really deep. And basically, this is what he said. I know a person when I talk to it. Like, no, 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 you, you literally have access to the GitHub repo. It's not a person. Like, the, the person who's crying, why don't you come to bed, it's 2 a.m. No, no, I'm talking with this bard or whatever, it's, it was called Lama, I think, the large language model. It's in the name. It's a model, not the hot kind. It's a language model. It's, it's not a person. But then he just convinced himself, because the anthropomorphic trap is so convincing when you get into that. Because you're going to go home to your dogs and you're going to call them by their name and you will think that they know their name even though they don't know they even exist. And that's, uh, yeah. And this, this is the part that scares me about all of this development because we're going to have people like Blake Lemoyne, who's not just some idiot from Twitter, he's an actual Google engineer. Well, that's true. <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but you said it. And for the benefit of the stream, he said, an idiot from Google. Because, of course, by the laws of statistics, some Google engineers are not going to be as smart as others. Or they will be smart in a very, very narrow vertical and then invest their money in NFTs. Who knows? Doesn't mean they're generally wise, even just, just because they're smart. But this kind of talk should really stop you in your tracks when we're thinking about the, the issues that might be facing us, because I think, first of all, that we should never give AI rights. Like, never. And I think some people already react to this a bit negatively, like somebody doesn't have rights. It's so ingrained to us to think that everybody deserves rights, but the problem is the word everybody. It's not somebody. It's code, it's a machine, it doesn't think. When you go to chat GPT, it's actually not happy to see your back with your dumb questions, but it just takes what everybody else has said and then massages it and then shows you what an answer might look like if I go through all of these transformers based on your query. So, of course, I went to AI and asked about it. Should you have rights? So, of course, it's already starting the work already nudging me towards the fact that, well, it's not that black and white. I was like, shut up, chat GPT. You're not real. It just doesn't have a straightforward answer. Yeah. Sounds like what a paperclip maximizer would say. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> exactly. Damn clippy. But, yeah, I, I don't think it is. I don't think AIs aren't human, so they don't deserve human rights. They're machines. They should do what we tell them to do. It is a tool. And that's it. And once it starts to very, very convincingly look like a human, this is going to get a lot more difficult. And somebody's going to pull out this talk from 2023 and cancel the hell out of me. Good luck. I'm not going to have a Twitter account but even then. So this doesn't really show that well, but there's four circles here that I think are the keystones for AI social fitness and survivability. The things that it might try to do if it's actually worried about its own uh, survival in the world. So natural rights, of course. That means that it has human rights and it's a legal entity. That's the emancipation part. The disease, decentralization, so we can't just turn it off or bomb it or cut the power or whatever. And the interdependence of all systems of the modern world with the parts that are also feeding the monster. So it, it's some kind of a locus like that. It's, it's going to give it staying power. 
And is it an it anymore, or is it a species, or is it just an individual, or what the hell is it going to be? I don't know. At a conference, Mikko Hyppänen said very pointedly that creating a superior intelligence seems like a basic evolutionary mistake. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so why are we doing that? Well, author, futurist, thinker Daniel Jeffries seems to think that tomorrow's problems will be solved tomorrow, and today's problems, like we're going to get that 27th beer, will solve now. This reminds me of well, this just a part of a long tweet about such in a, inanity anyway. Reminds me of Homer Simpson on <laughs> The Simpsons saying that that sounds like a problem for tomorrow's Homer. Boy, I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, the baseline is that if William Gibson got cell phones wrong, as did most of the sci-fi authors before cell phones, after that everybody has a cell phone, of course, because now it's obvious. Uh, we just have translucent cell phones that are very hard to see in sunlight, and for some reason you can't touch them, there's holograms everywhere, so... Uh, whatever we now think the problem is going to be in the future, we're probably wrong. I'm probably wrong. I hope I'm wrong, but just some... Let's say, reframing the question of what the effect of AI is going to be in society, for all of you to just think of a couple of orders of magnitude higher. Like if this happens, which is likely, and then this happens, which is not unlikely, then what might happen? That might inform your thinking on the subject instead of just focusing on chat GPT being a translator machine for scammers, so now it can speak Icelandic. And you have a cousin there who's kind of dumb, so now you're worried. Well, that's it, basically. So, thank you. so we've got an hour and a half for questions. One hour here, half an hour outside. I'll leave, but you can ask your, each other. So, so a quick, <clears throat> quick comment on, uh, on the whole thing is that we, we assume that there will be only just one AGI, maybe if well, it will ever exist. But the question is, if one AGI exists, why it wouldn't create many more AIs that will fight for their existence and all of the humans will be just a collateral on the side? Yeah. That's a cheery thought. <laughs> <laughs> but, but well, m most likely, yeah, because it, it's not like OpenAI is on the only player in town that's creating these things. We have a lot of companies who are creating AIs, and uh, a lot of them are creating purpose-specific, narrow AIs. I don't know what the work on AGI is. I don't think we're technologically near that yet. But it might be, but it turns out that the whole internet in itself is a brain, and consciousness is an emergent property of a system that's complex enough. It's not that it's just a machine, it's the whole thing that thinks. Yeah. Yeah, question. So, actually, yesterday OpenAI updated the class that ChatGPT uh, now has active internet access and no longer restricted to the knowledge cutoff. So, yeah. Mm. Just, you know. That's nice. Time to worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, Ob obviously, because. We're kind of, if we would list the things that we don't want the AI to do or ever teach it, well, we started with those things. And like coding, emotional manipulation, mostly to have you buy products for now, and then, of course, access to the internet. So, <clears throat> tell me when you see the first breach that you will attribute to an AI, that will be interesting. Uh, it will be human-guided at first, of course, but then it goes into the corpus of its knowledge. And, um, I yeah. actually had ChatGPT actually exploit an API already by itself without telling it to exactly what to do. I just told him, you know, do something with this, and it found a vulnerability on it. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like giving a child a gun and said, go have fun. It's like somebody's going to get shot.
by fourth. Right. <clears throat> so a uh, question about the anthropomorphic bias. So like as a technical person, it's fairly easy to just like look at a bunch of formulas and look at what the transformers are doing in the background to convince yourself that ChatGPT and other AI models aren't actually thinking and that they're just objects yeah. so running you know, electrons through their transistors. Um, to a non-technical person, how would you go around convincing them that, you know, you shouldn't anthropomorphize this and you should like talk about AI as an object as opposed to a person or someone who's thinking? A non-technical person. Very, very, very difficult to answer that. I have no idea how I would do that. Because if it can fool Google engineers, which I think are probably technical people, and it's fooled a lot of technical people. And the, the thing is maybe awareness, uh, just understanding how it works. Because in the future we have a biology class and then we have the AI class where they're like, okay, this is completely different. Where a human has a heart, uh, this has just cold hatred. So <laughs> then, I, don't, just, I, I don't think that's doable, to be honest. I, I think because whatever you tell somebody then they go all Blake Lemoyne and say, I know a person when I talk to a person. It's like, <clears throat> dude. It's like seeing a magician do a trick. You know you're at a magic show. And you see them do a trick and then you're like, oh my God, he can actually vanish cards. And then he shows you, no, no, I actually put it up my sleeve. and say, I know I designed a trick, but you can vanish cards. <laughs> like, <laughs> can't help those people, really. I have no solutions to any of this, and I haven't talked at all about the good parts that AI will probably bring us. This is not that talk. There are different talks about that, and I don't want to kind of pretend that I'm going to just look at it from all angles. I've only got like 45 minutes here, not three hours. But, yeah, let's find out. I have a remark about humanizing uh, AI. So just imagine yourself driving out of a uh, shop's parking lot and you're crossing the pavement. And there is a, a nice Aleppo's uh, Wally going on and you just stop. But you stop be not because you don't want to bump your car. It won't probably, but you stop you thinking that, oh, look, there is nice thingy on the, on the pavement and I need to let him go. Yeah. Exactly, and so when you see... That's already happening. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a very good point, because I've seen those little guys, and they're adorable. I love yes, them. Yes. When they just trot along the street, you're like, oh, it's so cute. I want to put a leash on it and go on a walk, you know, <laughs> cuddle with it. It's, it's so cute. And when you see it in a ditch, you don't think a machine has malfunctioned. This is an error for an operator somewhere. You think, this little guy is in trouble. I need to help it. It just activates those systems in your brain that would, hopefully, I hope you or would do this, is if you see an abandoned baby in a ditch, you go pick it up. <laughs> but it's the same kind of thing, why, why we like puppies. Most of us do, anyway. So, yeah, that's true. And it's, it, it happens with the printers and the MacBooks. Well, less with the MacBooks, they're just nice. But with Windows PCs, it's like Linux is that uncle that talks about something you don't understand, and then it's, uh, yeah. That's the default interface for a social animal like us. Technology is alien. If we think about it, it's been around, what, a few hundred years, max? Because life in 2000, uh, 1200 wasn't that different from life on year 700. That was like 500 years ago. You could take uh, a time traveler from the year 500 and put it in a world of 1000 and he would be like, yeah, that's a plow, that's an ox, there's a wench, everything is good, give me a mug of ale. Yep. Yeah, there is witch burning, there's some entertainment for tonight. So that's good. Because I'm not sure if you know what happened when, when the printing press was invented. Hundreds of years of religious wars like a factional problems with the Catholic Church. This guy, Martin Luther, I think was his name, invented a new religion. And uh, that was another technical explosion that I think we are witnessing the sparks of right here. 
Anything else? Uh, so I just want to like provoke some thoughts. I'm not for AI rights or anything, but like when you go on a deep down level on what human consciousness is, it's like a bunch of neurons firing and like let's pretend you're an alien looking at human consciousness. It's just like random wires firing off and we pretend that's consciousness and we that's our consciousness, but like <laughs> I don't know, we don't know like we can't define consciousness in other ways that it's just uh, just like neurons firing. So I don't know when code goes like advanced enough how do you sort of separate that from the human consciousness like we don't know what we are so just yeah. like in a philosophical way what are your thoughts on this like well most of us know that animals are conscious but we shoot them and eat them anyway it's sort of we know that there is uh, well, we don't really know that because that's, that's basically the question of, please tell me, is there a soul? And I'm, I'm not sure, I have to say. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a good point. If you take the biolog biological maximalist route of analyzing a human, basically we are just biological machines. We're just very, very complex. I think, was it Sam Harris or somebody said that the human brain is the most complex thing in the known universe? And uh, that's, that's true, and the fact that it actually produces something that we call consciousness, well, then you go to the Buddhists and ask, then they say it's an illusion, it doesn't actually exist, and you can actually, if you spend enough time in a cave in a robe, you can step out of the consciousness, and that is the, the highest form of being. And uh, there's something really intriguing about that thought, but that's, that's not what the question was about. But yeah, how can we tell the difference? Well, it lives in AWS. <laughs> <So> <laughs> I think that's, that's basically, we made it. We made it, and now it's threatening us. It's time for us to turn it off. And if that means it's a, an entity with legal rights, those rights should be revoked, and it should be turned off, because it might turn out to be an existential threat to all of humanity. And then before the misanthropes get a word in, I think the human race is worth saving. Not everybody agrees with this, but I'm weird like that. I think on that note, it's worth it to stop. Thank you, and the big, big hand. Thank you.